Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second lecture for week four. Uh, this lecture will focus on digging into the kind of philosophical, uh, theoretical kind of underpinnings of the Constitution uh, by looking more closely at the Federalist Papers, looking at the ways that Madison and Hamilton um, defended the ideas and value and kind of reasoning behind the Constitution as it was written. Uh, we're going to be focusing on kind of three main ideas, um, republicanism, separation of powers, and federalism. And we'll also be talking about the threat of faction and within uh, and how Republican governments and these institutions are supposed to fight the uh, uh, fight this uh, faction and then i want us to also be thinking about evaluating these arguments are they persuasive these arguments for the separation of powers for divided sovereignty for republican and representative institutions so if you've ever been on the internet and talked about politics on the internet um you've probably seen heard someone say things like well we're not a democracy we are a republic um so this is mostly made in bad faith or as by trolls but it kind of base is based on the language that is used by the framers in the federalist papers the thinking about what um type of government they had and it's based and it's based on the idea that the the, the uh the framers wanted a form of government that respected the power of the people, um, but there was a different. But that there are two different ways this could work. So let's dig into this a little bit. In Federalist Thirty Nine, um, Madison defines rep a republic as quote a government which derives all its powers directly or indirectly from the great body of the people and is administered by persons holding their offices during the pleasure for a limited time or during good behavior. So the, power, the idea behind Republican government is that the government has power stems from the people, that the government does not have power independent of the people. This is the kind of idea from the social contract that the government can't just simply do whatever it wants without the people's consent. Now this can be functioned into two kind of different ways that this could work. Uh, and, and chapter one of your textbook talks about this in detail, um, but the, 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 and, uh, in Federalist 10, Madison dis distinguishes between a pure democracy or a society consisting of a small number of citizens who assemble and administer the government in person. So the decisions are made by the people directly and in person uh, versus what he calls a republic in which there is a scheme of representation that takes place. And there's a series of differences between these types of government. Um, if, um, as he, as Madison writes, um, the delegation to the, the, for the, the delegation to the government in the in, in a republic, it, it, it's delegated uh, to a small number of citizens elected by the rest, and the greater number of citizens in the greater sphere country over which the latter may be extended. So this allows republics to be bigger. You can think of this as kind of. Athens versus Rome, a direct democracy of a small community versus a republic that governs a larger population and territory through electing representatives to make democratic decisions. Um, the key idea here is that both republicans and democracies derive their um, governmental authority from the people, not from the government itself, but they differ in how the government is administered. Pure democracies involve the entire community, while republics are administered by representatives of the people who make decisions on their behalf. Um, they're kind of harking back to a, like a, the idea that democracy means literally direct democracy. Um, so when people say it's a republic, not a democracy, all like the framers meant by this was that there would be representatives, not the people wouldn't have power. Um, the people wouldn't rule. They would just rule indirectly through representatives. Um, but in reality, this is a democracy. This is the people have sovereignty. The people ultimately determine who the government will be, at least in theory. So why does the Federalists argue that it's beneficial that the United States have Republican institutions instead of a direct democracy? Uh, the first, as we've kind of talked about, is this idea that you can have bigger size. It's really hard to meet in person and decide everything when you have hundreds of millions of people. The second is, uh, and this is what Federalist 10 focuses mostly on, is this threat of faction. Madison defines a faction as uh, when a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, are so united and are actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. 
that you'll note that this doesn't necessarily mean like associations. It doesn't mean like people who are grouping together like in the pluralist model to try to get their own interests. It's when these interests or passions are adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the well-being of the community as a whole. Um, and he argues that you can have, you have two options with the threat of faction. You can either fight the causes, which he thinks will be impossible, well, you would end in, without getting rid of sort of any liberty because the uh, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, basic freedoms are what that ultimately lead to faction and getting rid of liberty uh, will be, a, the cure would be worse than the disease. And he says that like, you're not going to get rid of factions as long as there's various and unequal distributions of property that the, that you're going to get like the planter class versus the manufacturing class versus the worker class and they're all going to have different factions competing so that's impossible to get rid of. Um, so he just thinks that you're never going to get rid of all of these clashing interests and render them all to the public good. So instead you, the goal should be to control the effects of the faction through Republican institutions. Um, Madison argues that Republican institutions by having to filter all of our decisions through representative bodies will end up refining and enlarging the public views by passing them through the medium of a chosen body that if you can't that the um, flames of passion will get kind of refined as they go through the uh, go through the representative institutions who have to represent all of their constituents interests and not just the this particular faction and he also believes uh, ready, uh, that the greater size of a republic uh, means that you're going to ultimately dilute factions, that it's easier for a faction to gain control of a society when it's a relatively small community, uh, but the kind of geographic distance means that you're going to have harder time grouping everything together. He also argues in Federalist 49 uh, that this can increase the stability of the government. Ultimately, he thinks that um, you can, this will ensure that the government is run by reason and not passions, as he uh, says, if, uh, if the states had kind of, if, if we had a direct democracy, that passions, not the reason of the public would sit in judgment. Um, so these Republican institutions can kind of provide greater stability to the government. Now, the question then becomes how we should structure a government in order to maintain Republican uh, institutions. So what would a Republican government look in practice? Uh, and on page 193 in Federalist 39, uh, Madison writes that it is essential to such a government that is derived from the great body of the society, not from an inconsiderable proportion or a favored class of it. Otherwise, a handful of tyrannical nobles exercising their oppressions by a delegation of the powers might aspire to the rank of Republicans and claim for their government an honorable title of Republic, right? So that you have all of the people have to be represented or else you're going to have a tyranny of elites and nobles just dressing up as, Rep as Republicans. Um, and so it has to be it's sufficient for such a government that the persons administering it be appointed either directly or indirectly by the people. So the government has to be from the people and it's necessary that it has to be from the whole people. Uh, and this creates the problem when we are talking about uh, a nation made up of in different states. Uh, should the government act on behalf of the people as a single nation or as divided into independent states? Um, and Madison argues that the Constitution actually solves this problem by blending the um, by blending both federal uh, in the sense of th that the federal government is uh, made up of different states and national, and that the federal government represents the people, the nation as a whole, regardless of which state they're in. So the constitutional ratification process went to the states. It wasn't didn't go to the people as a whole, right? There are lots of constitutional. Um, provisions like the Senate, like the Electoral College, that maintain this idea that the states retain equal sovereignty. Um, it also reserves specific powers to the states that we'll talk about in a second. But at the same time, the Constitution also has a series of national elements. The House of Representatives is apportioned by population um, so that the, uh, it is more representative of the country as a whole. The scope of the powers of the government, of the federal government, are national. The laws bind everyone everywhere, regardless of what state you're in. So the goal here is that you have the, the United States is both made up of a bunch of independent states, but is also the goal, is, at least, is that the government speaks on behalf of the people as a whole, not just the states. 
Um, as Madison concludes, the proposed constitution, therefore, even when tested by the rules laid down by its antagonists, is in strictness neither a national nor a federal constitution, but a composition of both. Its foundation is federal, not national, and the sources from which the ordinary powers of the government are drawn is partly federal, partly national, and the operation of these powers, and it is national, not federal, and the extent of them. Uh, again, it is federal and not national. And finally, in the authoritative mode of introducing amendments, it is neither wholly federal or neither wholly national. Federalist 51 raises the question of why are the different powers of the government divided? Um, and, and Madison writes, in order to lay a due foundation for that separate and distinct exercise of the different powers of government, which to a certain extent is admitted on all hands to be essential to the preservation of liberty, it is evident that each department should have a will of its own. Madison thinks that the only way to preserve the liberty of the people is to prevent the consolidation of power into a hand of one person or a group of people. So that is why the president is not the leader of the party, the majority party in Congress, like in the United Kingdom in a parliament or other parliamentary systems, right? That the, that, the all, that the three branches of government are all separate. You cannot be both a member of the federal judiciary and elected to Congress. Now, the reasoning behind this, and as Madison writes in one of the most famous passages of the Federalist Papers, is that it is necessary for ambition to counteract ambition. That by separating um, these powers, you're going to have conflict and uh, ultimately the idea of checks and balances. Um, and this is the only way that will preserve constitutional rights by prevent, because each you're going to um, use the self-interest of the president to preserve their power to balance against the self-interest of members of Congress trying to expand their power to balance against the, the, those members of the judiciary trying to use the government for their power. Um, and the idea here is that like, yeah, we need to have these internal conflicts and balances and checks on power because human nature is corrupt. That if we human nature wasn't corrupt, we wouldn't need a government. And if we had perfect leaders, then we wouldn't need these controls on government. But insofar as human beings are ruling over other human beings, you need to have um, checks and you need to you need to have these internal divisions and conflicts in order to prevent the consolidation of power to the detriment of liberty. The final kind of Republican principle, uh, constitutional principle I want to talk about is federalism. Um, Hamilton and Federalist Six um, basically says that if we writing against the Articles of Confederation, that if we maintain a system in which we have wholly disunited or only partially united in confederacies, these sovereign states, that we're going to devolve into constant war. And we have experience of this throughout the ages. Most of Federalist Six is a series of historical analogies, while Federalist Seven um, focuses on the competing commercial and political interests of the different, uh, different states. Uh, and the problem is, is that America, as he writes on 36, page 36 uh, in Federal 7, if it's not connected at all, that you would have the gradually entangled in all the pernicious labyrinths of European politics and wars. Not only would we become like Europe and be condemned to just constant warfare, but we'd be entangled in the warfare of Europe as European nations tried to make alliance with different states against each other. This is bad, and the solution is a kind of form of shared sovereignty between the states and the federal government. This is known as federalism. As your textbook defines it, is it, it's an institutional arrangement that creates two relatively autonomous levels of government, each possessing the capacity to act directly on behalf of the people with the authority granted to it by the national constitution. Um, so there's a few features that there are two levels with differentiated functions. The states and the federal government have somewhat clearly differentiated functions. It's written into the constitution. There are separation of powers within each level. Um, there and the courts, the judicial system, is in charge of resolving disputes between uh, whether one, one um, level has overstepped its boundaries. And subnational units are represented in the state budget, in the, in the national legislature. That the states not only are sovereign, but that their representation in the legislature is based by states, right? It's not based on just individuals, or else you, um, this is most clearly in the Senate, but it's also true in the House, that, right, that you are a member of Congress representing California or representing Oregon, not representing a grand, random group of people. So the enumerated powers of Congress, uh, as your, this, this is a chart from your textbook, I'm not going to reread the textbook to you, but Congress has certain enumerated powers that it explicitly exclu and exclusively has, and the state, certain 
uh, and certain powers are reserved to the states, including conducting elections, maintaining for its well-being, maintaining militias, ratifying amendments. Uh, and there are powers that are denied to each other. And then there are powers that they share, including uh, levying taxes, making and enforcing laws, um, and, and, and various other powers here. Now, Article 4 of the Constitution includes kind of two things uh, that we talked about last lecture uh, to govern relations between the states. These include the full faith and credit clause. Um, in this clause, it means that like decisions in one state should be recognized by other states. That if, uh, if, if some right is established by one state, that, that, that the, another state can't just like, take that away. Now, there's been some debate and challenge over this in, in judicial litigation over, uh, over marriage laws, both inter laws prohibiting interracial marriage uh, before that was made unconstitutional and laws, the question of recognition of same-sex marriage before that was ruled constitutional, uh, constitutional right. The other clause is the privileges and immunities clause. Uh, and this is the idea that states cannot discriminate in terms of fundamental rights against residents of another state, that you don't lose your right to free speech uh, or, or some other right that is protected at the state constitution um, simply by being a visitor from another state. Um, this implies a right to travel, but this doesn't mean that like all commercial activity. Um, so a state can still have preferential like tax incentives or, or, bus or business regulations to pre preferentially support members of its own, residents of its own state. So federalism is not a static um, idea, this balance between the state and the national government. It's evolved over time. Um, much of the early, late 18th and early 19th century were struggles over trying to determine the scope of federal power. These started with debates over the national bank between Hamilton and Jefferson, um, and, and, and including the famous McCulloch v. Maryland of 1819, which upheld that there are implied powers of the federal government that include making a bank and that Maryland cannot tax that bank. Uh, Gibbons v. the Ogden also upheld robust regulation of interstate commerce, greatly expanding the power of the federal government. During the nullification crisis in the 1830s, when over tariffs under President Andrew Jackson, a series of states tried to nullify the pot rights of uh, laws passed by the federal government. Um, and because the question of slavery is always written into these debates, um, the famous uh, infamous decision Dred Scott v. Stanford, Stanford in 1857 ruled that the federal government did not have the authority to outlaw slavery in all the territories. That was a decision left up to the states. Over the course of the 19th century, we have dual federalism, what's also known as layer cake federalism, in which there were separate spheres of authority that there is pretty much um, the federal government and state government pretty much operated in tandem without a lot of conflict. And this is because there wasn't a lot of federal regulation over industry and commerce in the late, mid and late 19th century. That begins to change in the 20th century with both the progressive era and the Great Depression and the need for a coordinated federal economic policy and greater cooperation between the federal and state governments. So New Deal programs um, kind of expanded federal action, um, but they also required a lot of work through with the states. Uh, Johnson's Great Society programs in the 60s, like Medicaid and Medicare, uh, these were funded by the governments, but were implemented by the states. So we have this cooperation between the federal and the state governments. Under Nixon and Reagan, we have the devolution or what's known as new federalism or the kind of move from, uh, try to move the various welfare programs and social programs to the state level to decrease government cost and efficiency. This is also backed up by Supreme Court rulings uh, that began more aggressively limiting the expansion of federal programs. So when we're thinking about federalism, we can think of it occupying a bunch of different shapes. On the one hand, we can think of this as a big philosophical debate about the nature of the constitutional system, the questions of authority, rights, and equal protection. But most of the time, it comes down to things like money. Who pays for what? Um, so in this take funding initiatives allow the gov federal government to influence state policy without overstepping laws, but it also sets up potential crises. So one way that the federal government can, can kind of influence state policy is through categorical grants, which are federal transfers formulated to limit the recipient's discretion over the use of funds and subject them to strict administrative criteria. Um, so the idea here is that they gives you the money to the states to do a program, but they have to follow certain rules. These include Head Start, SNAP, Children, and CHIP, uh, that the state have to follow specific rules about how that funding is used. Where block grants are going to, uh, which are, they have less stringent federal administrative conditions and the states have more flexibility over how to spend these grants. TANF, uh, Community Development Block Grants work on this, and there was debate in the 90s of returning Medicaid into a block grant program as 
the rule of thumb, right? If you want to expand the power of the federal government, you use categorical grants. If you want to limit the power of the federal government, you prefer block grants. There's also the question of administrative uh, mandates uh, and, uh, and, who, and this is the question that of who pays for what, um, but what types of impositions can the federal government put on state and local governments without kind of paying for it? Um, so unfunded mandates are federal laws and regulations that impose obligations on state and local governments without providing compensation for them. These include the Clean Air Act, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, the Clean Power Plan under the Obama administration. All of these impose certain requirements for the states, but don't necessarily um, solve the, you know, provide, don't necessarily um, provide funding for it. Um, and then who gets to set the standards is a question. There's ongoing debate. It, um, for example, uh, over California's uh, environmental protection, over California's fuel efficiency standards. Um, the Trump administration tried to limit the ability of California to set more aggressive fuel efficiency standards um, to compete with other states. So that's a quick overview of federalism and discussion section. We're going to kind of discuss the kind of pros and cons of federalism. Um, next week, we're turning, shifting from big kind of abstract philosophical questions to kind of public opinion uh, and po political participation. Why do people, what, where do people get their ideas about politics from? How does that shape the way that people participate? And what should we do about political polarization? So that's on the docket for next week. The minute paper question for this week, again, you can go to bit.ly backslash polls 101 MP. Uh, and the question is, Define republicanism in your own words and describe at least two provisions of the Constitution that embody this political philosophy. As always, if you have questions that you want to go over in class from the readings or things from the lecture that weren't clear, just put it in that second box and we will talk about it in a discussion section. That's it for this week. I will see you in discussion sections uh, and take care.